Good morning. Again, I greet you in the name of Christ. And, uh, you know, it's really a unique privilege to be involved in doing uh, work for the Lord and missionary work and being able to take the gospel of Christ to people who have never, ever heard and uh, or may have heard some bits and pieces but need a clear presentation of that gospel. <clears throat> it is also a unique privilege that we have in this day and age to be engaging in the work of Bible translation, that is, putting the Word of God into the languages of the world that still need to hear. In Psalm uh, 119, there are a number of verses in Scripture that one could look at, but uh, forever, verse 89, forever, O Lord, your Word is settled in heaven. He says forever, not for a time only. We live in the earth, and this is a, we're here for a time. Uh, verse 103, he says, How sweet are your words to my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. From your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Would to God that today in our culture here in America that people would have an honor and a respect for the Word of God, and then they would hate some of those things that are out there in our culture that are so bad. A lot of things have happened. When I think back when I went to school, public school in Belleville, and I was raised in the Beachy Amish Church. We went to the public school there. And uh, at that time, in the sixth grade, I remember my teacher, public school, he had a Bible there in his desk. And he said uh, to us as students, he says, you don't ever put anything on top of that Bible. Sometimes we'd have to hand in our homework. And, you know, like kids do, they run up and throw it on the desk or whatever. And, a, and someone put his homework on top of the Bible and, and he would immediately tell the class and, and would tell that person, do not put anything on top of the Bible. It is the highest authority in this room. Think how our culture has changed. And uh, today, as we're talking about going cross-culturally and talking about uh, <clears throat> doing Bible translation, I want to talk about the necessity of doing Bible translation uh, in the context of the big picture of doing church planning work. Now, I know there are organizations in the world today where they specialize in doing Bible translation, but they're not doing it in context of planting churches. When Jesus Christ gave to us the Great Commission, and we are to be discipling the nations, how will you disciple the nations if you have not engaged in a church planning work and have not led men, women, and children to turn their back on false beliefs and trust in the finished work of Christ and in Him alone. And uh, we must be doing that, discipling the nations, teaching the gospel, and then teaching people how to walk with the Lord from that point out, and then to reproduce the things that we have modeled and taught to them, so that we are entrusting to faithful men those things that they can pass on to others also, generation after generation, till the Lord uh, brings history to its closure. Now, in a Bible translation project, when we're talking about translating, and I hope, as you know, as I'm sharing this morning, that uh, you understand that Bible translation, it's a big undertaking. It's a lot of work involved. But on the other hand, it is doable. I believe there are more people who have the ability to do Bible translation uh, out there in, within Christianity than, than they actually realize it because they haven't ever even thought about it or maybe never even uh pursued it to see what they could actually be doing. So when we're talking about Bible translation, we need to be thinking about what needs to be done. Uh, many languages in the world, several thousand languages, which uh, do not have a translation on hand. And uh, uh, when we're talking about Bible translation, you know, this is a, a commitment that I believe churches need to make and uh, mission agencies, sending agencies need to make. It's a long-term involvement. Now, it doesn't have to be so terribly, terribly long to get the translation done, but when you do a Bible translation, as we did with the Moak tribe, and uh, first of all, we did it in context of planting that church, and when the believers then now having the Holy Spirit, and it was like a light came on in their mind and kept on getting brighter and brighter, and so eventually, uh, the first translation in a tribal setting like that, probably has a lifespan of about 20 or 25 years. And then you need to go back and revise it because people have a better understanding. Their mind can process information at a different level. 
So we need to be thinking about <clears throat> how is Bible translation going to be done? What is it that needs to be done? Sometimes there are translations that are in the culture, uh, but yet they are not really usable. They're archaic or uh, they simply are not good quality translations. So in a situation like that, Bible translation does need to be d uh, done. When we are doing church planning work, we need to be able to have the Scripture in our hands and to say, this is what the Word of God says. And you need to have a translation that is usable by the people that are out there. And so, uh, when we're talking about what is the, what needs to be done and how are we going to go about doing it, what methodology, who's going to be doing it? Some Bible translation takes place where the translators spend X amount of weeks or months right there with the host society, the people that they're working with, and then they go off to a center, maybe to another location and spend months there doing the academic part, but they're really not with the people. I wouldn't dream of doing translation like that. You need to be there with the people day in and day out, and when they're standing there in front of you, smell their bad breath and everything like that, because you need to be there a living light, a testimony of what the Word of God is. And uh, then the other thing is, you know, translation, it costs a lot of money to produce a translation. It takes years of work. You've got to support that missionary team that's going to be doing it. And then when it comes to printing, printing presses don't say, hey, I want to print it for free. It's going to cost money. So people are going to have to be working back here, asking God to bless their, their business or their jobs or whatever so they can put more in to that pro uh, project to support what needs to be done. Now, when we're talking about, <clears throat> again, I firmly believe that the stewardship that Jesus Christ has entrusted to us is not just a, a uh, one thing that we do, you know, specializing something in, in a given area, but we need to be doing, thinking comprehensively and uh, need to be thinking about what needs to be done to keep that church plant ongoing until the trumpet sounds and the Lord takes us home. In our case, we had to, you know, write that unwritten language. We had to re develop the alphabet for them. We had to teach them how to read and write. The first time I showed them some pictures, they had no idea. These tribal people had no idea what they were looking at. And I said to this one man, I said, surely you have seen your reflection in the water already. Look at that picture that I'm handing there, uh, holding in front of you. What's that look like? And when he saw that it was a photograph of himself, and this was in the early days, we didn't know the language, he grabbed that little picture album out of my hand, ran out into the village, and I didn't see it for probably an hour or so later, because everyone was so excited to see their pictures. How do you hold a book? You know, how do you turn a book? You know, and from pages, you know, we read in our Western culture, we, we have a way of reading, and uh, when it comes to people who have never handled literature, they don't know what's right side up or what's uh, or uh, what's the wrong way up. And we took some uh, magazines sometimes with us. And in the early days, we'd see them. They'd have the magazine in hand, pictures upside down, writing upside down, amusing themselves and having no idea that it didn't even make sense to us looking at it like that. So it was just a, a very different dynamic. And so we had to be doing literacy work and developing Bible lessons and developing lots and lots of Bible lessons. And so uh, I believe that there is a right way to do Bible translation, and I believe there is also a way that we can do translation that while we get the job done, and in some respects it's an academic uh, exercise, get the job done, but not an example of what we ought to be doing. Let me illustrate. 1983, we were brand new missionaries on the field of New Guinea, on the little island, uh, New Britain Island. And uh, we arrived there in mid-August. About a month later, there was a New Testament dedication in that area. So about a half hour up the coast, they were going to have a, a dedication in the, uh, sometime in September. And uh, I was able to attend that New Testament dedication. Now this missionary, in the dedicate, when as the New Testament was dedicated, and they had a lot of fanfare that was going on, a lot of hoopla that was going on. And he turned around and he said to us with New Tribes Mission, we were a very small mission on that island at that time, maybe half a dozen families. And we were the ones who were going into the Moak tribe. Another tribal work had already been opened. And in that New Testament dedication, he said, you little missions need to learn how us bigger missions work together. 
And in the process of that New Testament uh, dedication, he turned around and gave that New Testament, and we as a mission, New Tribes, and said, give it to us. We will teach it to the people. We'll do the church planning. He said, no, I am giving it to the Roman Catholic and the United Church. And so he gave it to the Roman Catholics to be the guardians of that translation. Now let me ask you, do in the history of Roman Catholicism, have they encouraged the reading of the Bible by private individuals? Of course not. And so, but he gave it to them. And then, uh, and, and he made a sort of a big to-do, you know, in terms of what he was doing. In 2005, I was in that same location and I asked the people, 2005 and again in 2007, and I asked those people, I said, the Bible translation, I was here for the dedication, I observed what was going on and he gave it to the priest, I would like to know, do you people read that translation? What do you think they said? They said, no, we don't even know where it's at. The translation is archaic. It uses old language. He said, we don't want to use it. And furthermore, the priest, of course, would never have encouraged it. I believe that is an example of what not to do. And as the ABT is getting started, the Anabaptist Bible Translators, in, in, in conjunction, I believe, with the charity organization, you need to have some benchmarks in place to make sure this does not happen. If you go and look at the statistics and look it up, you will find that language group listed as having a translation done and not needing missionaries. I'm here to tell you that's simply not true. In 2007, uh, toward the end, or maybe 2008, New Tribes has uh, sent in a team into that very tribe and they're learning, in the process, learning the language and culture, will stu soon engage in uh, doing the chronological Bible teaching and they will also embark upon a Bible translation project because the one that was done is simply irrelevant. It is archaic. It is not being used. It is collecting dust and probably being eaten by the termites down along the seashore there in the coastal area. That, again, is not an example of what a person should be doing in Bible translation. Cases of that translation are just there. You know, Dr. Eugene Nida, who was one of the... Uh, modern-day um, uh, Bible translation experts and uh, really got behind uh, translating the Word of God, putting it into every man's language, made a statement. And I cannot give, find the reference, but uh, in one of my translation instructors taught me this, said that the best Bible translation still needs a Bible teacher. I firmly believe that. You know that? that really, that's really the way it is. You know, you can have the best translation in your hand, and there are many English versions, some of which you don't want to waste your money upon, but there are good English translations, and even so, we need people who can exegete the Scripture and can lay it out for us and help us understand it. Why would a host society believe, I mean, why would a translator believe that he just places the translation into a society that people are going to automatically read it, even want to read it? Let me ask you, does that work here in America? No, it doesn't work. We need people who teach the Word of God. Uh, we need people who have a compassion for lost souls. We need people who teach the Word of God and live it out so that people can see in